to warmly welcome Ben Connolly here from the Minnesota Zen Center just down the down the street <laughs> across town and I actually met Ben a few years ago I did a workshop with him on Vasubandhu's uh, Yogachara inside Vasubandhu's Yogachara and it was, it was so great so really happy to see you here again and um yeah, Ben is a teacher in the Soto Zen lineage, um, also in the Katagiri lineage as well, and is um, an activist, an organizer with many multi-faith groups. And uh, yeah, <laughs> is a writer and, and an amazing person all around. So I'm sure Ben will say much more to get started. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Uh, yeah, how wonderful to see you all. Oh, look, now I can see uh, the folks who are joining us online. Nice to see you. Uh, if at any point along the road you're not hearing me, could you just do something like this? And then I will change my conduct. My conduct will hopefully be responsive to the people I'm with. That's the way it should be. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, really grateful for the opportunity. I love this community. You know, I, I haven't been over for a little bit, but many times I've come and just sat here in the morning. I learned uh, meta meditation from Mark Nunberg here 20 years ago, and I still practice it all the time. So really grateful to be included. So I think the idea is that we'll start with a little meditation. Uh, so I think that's what I'd like to do first. We'll probably sit for about 25 minutes here. And then I'll give a talk for about 25 minutes. And then uh, we'll do some dialogue for maybe a half an hour, 25 minutes. So you can just find whatever posture is conducive to meditation for you. <clears throat> you know, being trained in the Soto Zen tradition, um, we use minimal uh, guidance, so I'll talk for a few minutes, but uh, we'll have a, a good amount of time of just quiet here. <clears throat> so I just invite you to find energy and length along the spine, putting the heart and the chest open up and forward. And as the heart and chest open up and forward, letting the shoulders release down. Finding energy, uprightness, dignity, nobility, already present in the body. Allowing the awareness to settle in the sensations in the lower abdomen. Perhaps noticing that the body expands a little bit as we inhale and contracts as we exhale. If you find you're unaware of the sensations in the 
lower abdomen. Well, that's uh, quite wonderful because you've noticed your awareness and you can just bring some attention to the lower abdomen and the breathing there. Just as you might bring your attention back to the voice and face of a beloved person who is telling you something when you've become um, distracted by some other sound or something passing by. And because you care, bring your attention to the beloved hear the body So as we sit here, there will be sensations in the body. There may be sounds. Or emotions feelings, there may be visual images, whether the eyes are open or closed. Maybe thoughts. smells or tastes. So we don't need to fix, judge or control any of it.
So in a moment, I'm going to ring a bell and we can sit quietly for about 15 minutes. This practice I'm offering is not about making anything in particular happen. It's not about attaining something or creating a particular state of mind. It's not about being something other than who you are right now.
feel free to move around, adjust your posture. <clears throat> Whatever seems right for your body. <clears throat> What a sweet and intimate thing it is to just sit quietly with some people. Amazing, amazing. Just checking out our, our online friends. It's always nice to have a look at people and I'm not able to see very well. Okay, so. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I'm so happy to be here and I'm just gonna jump into the material of this talk. So. I've been uh, spending a lot of time talking about Vasubandhu's Three Natures. Uh, it's a body of Buddhist teaching that's really important to me. So I wrote a book about it that's probably backwards and mirrored for you, <laughs> but it's green. Um, anyway, so uh, this is some Buddhist teachings that I found to be really um, powerful and transformative and supportive for me. So I've been pretty excited about uh, sharing them with other people. Uh, my guess is there are a lot of people here who don't have any idea who Vasubandhu is or what three natures means. So I'm just going to give a very brief kind of a background, and then I'm going to talk about the material in hopefully a way that will seem uh, practical for you. Um, Vasubandhu is a, probably a fourth or fifth century Indian monk uh, <clears throat> who is a, sort of a towering figure in, in Buddhism. So he's known for writing a text called the Abhidharma Kosha, which is the, has been the standard study text on uh, Buddhist psychology in Tibetan schools and most East Asian schools for 1500 years. Um, and that text is closely associated with what now we call like the Theravadan Buddhism and the Pali Canon. But during the course of his life, he uh, became more associated with what we think of now as Mahayana Buddhism and a movement within Mahayana called Yogacara. <clears throat> and uh, one of my favorite things is after he wrote the Abhidharma Kosho and all people all over Northern India was like, you have written the greatest summation of early Buddhist psychology ever written. You're just a wizard. This is the best. And uh, he was like, great. And then he subsequently wrote another text called the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, which is a commentary on the Abhidharma Kosha, which if you're still awake, after all this stuff I'm saying, means he wrote a commentary on his own book, which I think is just hilarious. But anyway, uh, the commentary is principally critique of his own teachings. Um, and I just take this to heart that even, you know, even if you're in a position where I was like, yeah, you got it, uh, to be able to be like, no, probably not. <laughs> I probably don't got it. Maybe I could keep looking and keep growing and keep uh, finding new insights. So anyway, his teachings uh, developed and he became uh, known as one of the great figures in, it's called Yogacara Buddhism, which means yoga practice. And uh, Yogacara is enormously influential on Tibetan and all East Asian Buddhisms. Uh, and yeah, so then uh, Yogacara is principally about integrating early Buddhist uh, teachings which are the ones that you're more commonly going to encounter here, teachings coming out of the Pali Canon or the Theravadan tradition with Mahayana teachings. <clears throat> and uh, this I think is uh, particularly value at this, valuable at this time, because this was an interest in the in mid first millennium India, there was a lot of, you know, kind of like debate. Who's right, who's wrong? Probably me is right. Probably you're wrong. That's the way it usually works. <laughs> but anyway, he was like, well, what if we just looked at all these and saw how actually they all have value and there's a way to integrate them that's coherent but doesn't deny their difference and enables you to access the power of the teachings from the various traditions. And, you know, at this time in, in, uh, in Buddhism in the world, we have a global Buddhist culture where it's very easy for people to access teachings and teachers from all different traditions because of the inf information structure we have. And so we're seeing people doing this kind of thing all over the place, sometimes completely unconsciously. Um, and uh, Vasubandhu gives us a great model for how to do it really well. 
Uh, so that's one of the reasons I think it's very valuable for people in the United States to be learning about this material. Um, one of the main reasons I teach it is because it's really the, the philosophical basis for the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh. And so I came to Buddhism in large part uh, through the vision that I, I read in Thich Nhat Hanh of an engaged Buddhism where we could be in the world engaging in transformation of harmful systems while we were taking care of ourselves. And uh, he really bases that system on Yogacara. And uh, so I feel like I'm carrying forward his work. He has several books on Yogacara that are very good. So that's another reason I do this. Um, the idea of Yogacara, one summation would be that it suggests, they sometimes say there are two barriers to realization, the barrier of affliction or afflictive emotion and the barrier of delusion. And they say that early Buddhist teachings, like from the Pali Canon, are particularly effective at treating the barrier of affliction. So treating uh, the emotional suffering that we experience. And Mahayana teachings are particularly effective at treating the barrier of delusion, which in this case means the delusion that there is anything that exists separate from anything else. <clears throat> so anyway, that's just kind of a general framework for why I'm doing this. Uh, yeah. So the three natures, what are the three natures? Three natures is one of the main teachings of Yogacara. So there's the three main teachings of Yogacara are mind only, the eight consciousnesses and the three natures. So we're going to leave two of those aside and just focus on the three natures for now. So the three natures, the idea is these are three natures that any phenomena has. Or you could say there are three aspects of any phenomena. So by phenomena, we mean uh, something you see, uh, uh, an emotion, a thought, a feeling in your body, a sound. So basically, any element of your experience, according to this teaching, has three natures. The three natures are the imaginary nature, the dependent nature, and the complete realized nature. So everything already has all these three natures, imaginary, dependent, and complete realized. Para Kalpata, Para Tantra, and Para Nishpana Svabhava. That's how I say it in Sanskrit, but you don't need to know that, probably. Anyway, so uh, these three natures, so the imaginary nature of things is what you think they are. The imaginary nature of things is what you think they are. The dependent nature of things is that they appear the way they do to you dependent on things that are not themselves. And the complete realized nature is that they are not what you think they are. That's it. That's it, no problem. So the imaginary nature of things is what you think they are. So this is a pretty startling assertion that anytime you think anything is anything, it's imaginary. You are, well, you're not, you're not imagining it. It's an imagination because there's not a you because the you that you think exists is imaginary, <laughs> which is pretty cool because imagining things is awesome. Anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so imaginary nature. Dependent nature is probably a concept that's familiar to you if you've been around Buddhism. The basic idea that each thing arises dependent on other things. Pretty simple, pretty simple. And the complete realized nature is that just isn't what you think it is. So the implications of these are sometimes almost the opposite of what you might think. Um, but I will say the basic idea of saying, oh, I will say the imaginary nature is closely related with samsara, or you could also say it's identical with samsara. And the complete realized nature is essentially identical with nirvana. So this is what, if you're not used to Mahayana teachings, you might be like, now this is weird. You're telling me everything is already samsaric and nirvanic all the time. That may seem pretty weird. Well, it might be pretty weird, but that's all right. Um, we can see what the implications are for us. What is What happens if we begin to think about things in this way? So I'm going to work through the three natures uh, one at a time here for, for a few minutes. So the imaginary nature. So the idea is... Uh, what we experience, we only experience what we experience in the way we experiencing it, which may seem really obvious, but 
we kind of forget that. And we think, oh, there's like an, I'm seeing the absolute truth. But what we're seeing is our way of experiencing whatever we're seeing. And so this is closely uh, associated with the idea of karma. So for people who really like Buddhism, basically what this idea of an imaginary nature is to reclaim karma for Mahayana Buddhism, which was starting to lose sight of karma in a certain sense. Anyway, so karma here in the Yogacara tradition, any act of perceiving, thinking, acting with the body, which includes speech, or having an emotion, plants a seed, a karmic seed, which will at some time produce a, a similar fruit. So any perceptual, cognitive, emotional, or behavioral action in any moment plants a seed, which will produce a similar fruit in the future. So my favorite example is I just got up, I did like a three week East Coast uh, tour talking about this stuff. And I was, I'm going to Vietnam in, in February, about which I'm so grateful to go uh, meet with a bunch of uh, predominantly nuns. But uh, I thought, well, I want to learn some Vietnamese that will be respectful. Turns out that's never going to happen, but I tried. <laughs> so anyway, I have my Vietnamese tape and I have my Vietnamese training class in my car and I would drive the car and the Vietnamese thing would talk to me. It would say, uh, Doi Hung Hyo Din Viet or something like that, which means I don't speak Vietnamese, which is about as far as I'm going to get. <laughs> but anyway, I would say this over and over. And what happened is, you know, they kept saying Doi and I was like, Doi. And I'm like, oh, that's, that means I, I. So each time I do that, it plants a seed of perceiving the sound d oi, as, a, as a, a things that fit together, that have a meaning, which is I. And then it also kind of goes, oh, I know what I is, reminding myself what I is. So every time I say that, I plant a seed. And if you plant a seed enough times, now when I hear that sound, doi, I know, oh, that means I. Right. So this is how language acquisition works, which is, and you, so every single word you ever hear is the product of thousands or probably millions or perhaps billions of iterations of people hearing that sound, the seed being planted and the meaning bearing fruit and it getting associated so it all makes sense to us. So just as I'm speaking right now, kajillions of things are happening so that you can turn whatever this thing is doing into like, oh, I get he's talking about something that makes sense to me. Now, I just did language. But the way we perceive space, like right now, you know, there's a ceiling, there's lights, those are different than dark things, shadows are different than light, bodies are different than chairs. All that is the product of millions and millions of seeds of cognition that are planted. Likewise, when you have an emotional state, when we have emotional states, it plants seeds for similar emotional states. And we know this is true, right? You turn on the radio, you hear a certain voice of a certain type of person, and you go, and then it's like the next time you turn it on, you hear that voice. It, lo and behold, similar fruit. Ah! Yeah. Or maybe you go, you know what? That sucks. I really don't like experiencing that. And you go, what if I just pause? And when I hear that voice, I just go, oh, I'm having this emotional reaction. I feel that energy. I care about it. I'm going to notice it. And then you turn that radio on and you hear that voice and you get used to that process of being compassionate and caring for what arises. So we plant all different kinds of seeds. So in many of these cases, the seeds we're talking about are planted unconsciously. Most of the, actually the vast majority of them completely unconsciously, but it's possible. This is one of the basic fundamental ideas of Buddhism is we don't have to be unconscious all the time. Amazing, amazing, yeah. So what this is about is power. The whole idea of karma in Buddhism and the fundamental idea of the Four Noble Truths is that you have power. There's suffering and you can do something about it. So by saying things are imaginary, the point is to remind you that we are actively engaging in imagining what the world will be for people. And what we'll see when we get to the dependent nature is that everything is always collective. So those, the way we imagine and the way we act and the seeds we plant 
are how we're creating the world. And when we do it unconsciously, we tend to reproduce the same systems we already have. And in case you haven't noticed, some of the systems are really non-awesome. So <clears throat> um, one other little aspect of the imaginary nature that I just like to talk about is that uh, it, oftentimes in, in Buddhist literature, you know, saying things are imaginary is a way of kind of going, don't worry about it so much. And that can be helpful. You know, it's like, geez, you ever just been completely freaked out about something and you suddenly go, wait a minute, that is not happening. And I remember just sitting, I was driving to my, desperately driving to my recovery meeting and I was late and I was so mad. And why is everything so hard? And I pulled up into the parking lot and I went, you know, it's not actually possible to be busy. That's not a real thing. It's not, doesn't exist. I'm here. I'm never somewhere other than here. It's just these feet on the floor of this automobile, these hands on this steering wheel, and here is where I am. And I'm all this angst from busyness is imaginary and it can't ever be something else. <clears throat> and it was just like, yeah. However, um, there are many different ways that viewing things as imaginary uh, can be beneficial. One is this reminding us that we have power, that we're actively engaged in imagining the world with everyone. Two, it can kind of like do that, like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't really what I think it is. But another thing that happens is just a celebration of imagination in the most conventional sense. That it's like, you know, or you do too much Zen practice and you're like, well, I'm really good at looking at walls. I can walk slowly, like super good. I'm incredibly good at walking slowly. But creativity and imagination are beautiful. So this book is a uh, co-translation with Wei Jen Tang of Dharma Drum University in Taiwan. And I translated Vasubandhu's Treatise on Three Natures, which is 38 verses long. And each chapter is a commentary that I wrote on one verse. So it's a line by line commentary. So anyway, I'm not telling you what the verse I'm commenting on here, but it is mentioned. I'm going to read here. This verse upholds one of the central tendencies of Yogacara thought. It affirms that something is happening and denies that it's what you believe it to be. In particular, Vasubandhu here reminds us that the illusion exists. What are illusions for if not joyful engagement? Sometimes people claim that saying things are illusory means we will not or should not care about them. This does not reflect my experience. We naturally delight in and marvel at magic tricks. We walk into plays, movies, and songs, and stories willing to be deeply moved or challenged. At the movies, people cry in the dark or cringe at a shock. We create illusions, and they transform us. We know that Wonder Woman isn't real, yet she inspires. We offer our whole selves to the experience of the illusions, the stories that artists offer. We can pour our whole selves more deeply into life when we realize that it exists as an illusion rather than as something to be grasped. And this is uh, one of the main things. Uh, this three natures vision gives us a vision of the world where there's nothing that can be grasped. It's a little scary because there's nothing you can hold on to. But if you really look, everything keeps going away. It's like that. So we're just getting closer to the truth. I realized that I totally forgot to read some introductory material. So I'm going to go backwards and read you another little passage that is like an overview of the three natures, which might make this whole thing make more sense. <clears throat> Every aspect of what we would conventionally call experiences of these three natures, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, physical sensations, thoughts, emotions, and our sense of being a self are imaginary, dependent, and complete realized. For example, the cobalt blue car that I can see outside my window is of an imaginary nature. Whatever I am experiencing it to be right now, a memory as I'm currently looking at letters on a screen, or now as I turn my head to look at it again, is a construction of habits of consciousness and imagination. I suspect it will take some time for you to consider this a reasonable or useful claim. And so, dear reader, that's why I'm writing this book. That car is also of a dependent nature. Countless conditions that are not the car create the appearance of a car. 
reflected sunlight, ocular nerves, supply chain software, oil refineries, the desire for wealth, and so on. This car is also of complete realized nature. It isn't what I think it is. Recognizing that things aren't what you think they are can radically disarm the patterns of your mind that cause you to suffer and cause suffering. For example, in order to see the car in my normal way, I am usually ignorant of or ignore a vast array of conditions on which the appearance of the car depends. Conditions that cause suffering in this time of climate crisis. These teachings are here to help us move beyond this kind of ignorance. The so-called knowledge that white people are inherently superior to black people and the purported fact that race exists as a biological truth were confirmed by 19th century scientific experiments, which have since been disproven. This caused and causes incalculable harm. This so-called knowledge is imaginary. It arises from condition and its complete realized nature is that it is not real. And yet millions of people thought and still think it is true. Although many of us do not, the impacts of this view are pervasive. It affects where people live, the jobs we have, the wealth we inherit, our access to education, and so much more. They are alive in how I experience the world. This teaching is here so we may continually grow in our capacity to end and transform harmful patterns of which we are often unaware. By learning to see the three natures of the ideas that maintain harmful systems, we open the way for liberation. <clears throat> so probably the main point there is to see that in both cases, when we're saying things are imaginary, dependent and complete realized, no matter how imaginary they are, their impacts on us and other people are all we have. They're not only very palpable to us, but that's what we live in. So uh, this is probably the biggest challenge of teaching yoga chara and actually a lot of Mahayana Buddhism is because people think we're saying that things don't matter, but we're saying they don't matter quite in the way that you think they do. And we're saying that what will help is probably a little different than what you think will help. <clears throat> so uh, moving on to the dependent nature, well, yeah. Does anything exist without anything else? You know, I used to do this thing when I was uh, doing uh, recovery retreats at Hazelden, where I just like, we'd have a little circle and I'd be like, I'd like pick up an object and I'd be like, we'd pass it around. And I'd just say, name something this depends on. And we'd go around until we all died of boredom and we wouldn't have even gotten started because you could go forever. You could, you know, just name things on which this clock depends. And you could start now and you could name things until you're dead and you wouldn't have scratched the surface. I mean, it just goes on and on. Everything is related. And so this basic idea, uh, of course, is present in pretty much every form of Buddhism, but in some, they emphasize it in different ways. Here, one of the main things to notice is that when we are very alienated from this truth, we feel alienated and alone. So one of the ways you can tell if you're getting closer to a sense of the dependent nature of things is do you feel connected to what's happening on an emotional affective level? You can, you know, an easy gauge is just the degree to which your mind is focusing on controlling an external, apparently external object. That's like an indicator that it, you're far away from realizing how truly connected to it you are because you think it's an object that could be manipulated instead of something in which you're deeply and profoundly intimate. <clears throat> so, but it can feel so good, right? You know, people, it's like they can go out and you just, uh, I went for a walk today and I was just walking by uh, Lake Harriet and there were people playing hockey and I was like, you're crazy. But I was just like, this is my community. And I, I saw the beauty of the trees and the sun going down, I felt so close. And you know, I assume you have these kind of experiences. You're getting closer to feeling the connection that the dependent nature is about. Uh, and sometimes we don't, and it's hard, it's hard. But uh, 
you know, recognizing that it's very valuable to see our dependency and our interdependency uh, really helps. So it can feel really good. Um, and as people practice and, you know, people will come to our Zen Center and we're very fortunate. We're right on Bidet Makaska. And so, you know, they'll come and they'll sit for an hour and then they go outside and they, they go, oh, I left. I'd never seen a tree like that in my whole life. You know, is it really seeing it? You're close. Right. So practice opens us up to this kind of intimacy or the practice of really listening, really listening. <clears throat> so uh, there's another side of this that often doesn't feel as good, which is that it is impossible to be separate from samsara in this teaching. You might be like, wait a minute. No, I, I've got a teaching that says I can get out of samsara. That's cool. Enjoy that. It's helpful. But that's not what this teaching is saying. Say you can't get out of it. Uh, even if you could, what we're inviting you to do is be liberated in it. In fact, there's a basic teaching in Yogacara is liberation is not liberation from samsara, it's liberation in samsara. So that is to say suffering. Dependent nature is about realizing our intimacy with suffering, all modes of suffering. And uh, that can be hard. I mean, ultimately, you know, it's good. When you actually face the things that are difficult, it feels better than pretending they're not there. But at the same time, that step of getting closer can be pretty hard. So that's why we support each other. That's why we have a teaching that reminds us of the value of this. And, you know, there's many ways this is true, just with our own psychology and in our families. But, you know, I'll just take, uh, you know, the example, going back to an example of like, uh, of race, it's like, I was raised in the northern Midwest, and it was like, yeah, there's a lot of talk about how like Southerners were like, it's like racist in the South. Like, oh, it's over there, right? Oh, well, it's over there, then I don't have to be a part of it, right? And then it's like, I started learning more about it. I'm like, no, it's pretty much right here. I live in it. I can't be apart from it. Um, dependent nature wants me to say, this is a system, there's no escaping. There isn't any system. I'm not saying it, it just happens to be the one I'm talking about. I'm a part of it, which means I have agency. I don't have to keep doing it. I can try and do something that will help. So we can see how it's like, oh, couldn't I just like blame it on someone else? You know, it's like, I think it's, I shouldn't say this, uh, but you know how it is. You blame it on someone else. I won't tell you who you blame it on, but you probably blame it on someone else. And so just saying, oh yeah, I'm blaming. I'm trying to objectify, trying to stay safe. And how can I just move closer and be like, this is the world I live in and it's, it's dependent on me and I'm dependent on it. And the thing is, we often see people very, you know, we get very reactive. You sit down to do a Joanna Macy workshop on, climate change and it's painful but you know you can go through that pain and you get closer to the truth which is your intimacy with the world with the world and ultimately that's so much more of a joyful and beautiful space to live from <clears throat> so the complete realized nature yeah the good news, everybody. Well, this is all good news, right? It's all cool. Uh, nothing wrong with being part of the universe. I mean, you don't have an alternative, so you might as well enjoy it. I think. Um, anyway, the complete realized nature. So um, the complete realized nature is a, an aspect of any phenomena you ever encounter. That's what I'm claiming. That's what the tradition claims. So the complete realized nature is what Buddhas see. So what a Buddha sees is the complete realized nature. And what makes Buddha Buddha is the seeing of realized, complete realized nature. So that's really the fundamental thing. They see that nothing is what they think it is. It's not a bunch of objects to be manipulated, acquired, or pushed away. So the basic idea is, you know, our imaginary, the way we construct the world, it's made of stuff, which comes and goes, which can be grabbed, pushed away. And we suffer so much because we're trying to hold on to things that always pass. We're trying to get things that we can't get. 
we get it for a little bit. We're like, oh, great, I got it. And then it's like, oh, damn, it went away again. It's hard. So the idea is we can see a world where it is not objectified, a non-objectified world, because it's not objects. So that's the claim of this tradition is that's the vision of liberation. But other claim is it's already not objects. It's an illusion or an imagination that they are. That they are. So this is, you know, you may not be used to this kind of thing because I don't know what you're teaching over here at Common Ground, but in Mahayana Buddhism, it's like, you're Buddha. It's too late. If you don't like being Buddha, I can't do anything about it. It's too late. Nothing is apart from realization. Everything is a part of realization. So this may seem really strange. You know, sometimes you'd be like, oh, wow, really? And they go, probably not. Now, now, this old thing? I don't think so. That's okay. I'm here to tell you that Buddhism is a religion. It's a religion. It does rely on faith. It does rely on faith. Sometimes, or it can. So oftentimes when talking about the inherent, complete, realized nature of things, uh, um, the language will be one that talks about the self and the environment. So at the end of Yoga uh, Vasubandhu's uh, 30 verses on consciousness only, the last verse is, uh, this, this is the complete, wholesome, unstained, constant realm the blissful body of liberation, the Dharma body of the great sage. That is to say, this, like you could wave your arms around and be your this, if you knew how to, if you knew these phrases, this is the wholesome, complete, unstained, constant realm, and this is the blissful body of liberation, the Dharma body of the great sage. So at that point in the text, he said, that's what you see if you see the complete realized nature. But remember, you can't not see the complete realized nature because everything's already a complete realized nature. You just might not be noticing it. Anyway, so I know this may seem super weird. That's okay. That's okay. It is kind of weird. Um, <clears throat> the end of the song of Zasa and Hakuin almost quotes Vasubandhu when he writes, this very place is the lotus land, this very body, the Buddha. Okay. This very body, the Buddha. The Buddha. So I just want to read you a couple short passages related to this aspect of the teachings. One will be more related to the inherently complete realized nature of the phenomena we would conventionally understand to be the self. These are a lot of words. But I'm trying to be precise. Anyway, I'll read one about that and then I'll read one about our apparent environment. This is from a chapter called Already Buddha. When I came to Buddhist practice, I was seeking something else. I sought an escape from the anguish I experienced. My therapist told me it was the anguish of trauma from the past reproducing itself. My psychiatrist told me my brain didn't process serotonin properly. My addiction recovery friends called it defects of character, self-will run riot. My Buddhist studies called it afflictive karma. All these ways of looking at it have their utility and I am deeply grateful for all who have supported me in finding the wondrous joyful existence of today. When we suffer, when we see the suffering of others, it is right to seek wellness, to seek something else. However, it is also true that there is not something else, that you and I are not and cannot be broken or if there's brokenness, there must be a wholeness that is elsewhere. This is a duality, and duality is just a habit of mind. And this pertaining more to where we're at. <clears throat> recently, I heard a talk by Dakota. But, uh, recently, I heard a talk by a Dakota elder named Bob Clanderud. He spoke of the total kinship of all life. He told us that the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers near my home on U.S. occupied Dakota land is called Bedote. For the Dakota, Bedote is the origin of the universe, the land of Genesis. In his words, 
It is Eden. He asked us, now that you know you live in Eden, how will you choose to live? Thanks, Bob. Uh, thank you all for listening. <clears throat> um, I think it's nice to um, have a dialogic process, but we have an interesting uh, technological arrangement here, whereby there are many people, hello, 30 people or so, who are online and then about, I don't know, a dozen, 15 people in here. And not everyone is going to be able to hear each other. Uh, whoop. Name of the Dakota elder, Bob Klanderud with a K. Bob Klanderud, K-L-A-N-D-E-R-U-D. -E Bob Klanderud, amazing person. Associated with uh, Min uh, Healing Minnesota Stories, an amazing organization. Anyway, so... It's not going to be easy for people to hear each other. So although it would be really fun to hear more words from the people in the group, I think what we need to do is I'm going to ask you if you'd like to ask questions or like, could you talk more about that thing? So you have to be kind of brief because people won't be able to hear you. And then I can repeat back what you said. And then I'll, I'll meander around in the world of verbiage some more. That is the case. There is not. So sorry. That's just how it is. There are many ways to be in dialogue. So uh yeah. I have a couple of questions actually, but I can ask one and that. So if I am Buddha, well, by the way, I live on right across the street from the Vidoche. Oh, cool. So this goes with this question. So if I'm Buddha and at Eden, am I also Mara because I'm a cross report smelling? And that was my question. If I'm Buddha and my Mara, is that Part of it. That's one. Yeah. Well, I think so. <laughs> um, but you know, I don't I don't get into Mara that much. So someone else would maybe do more with Mara. But the idea of Mara, I don't uh I just don't work with it very much. But what I can say, you know, your question really is like, how how do we work with the I, I think it has to do with how do we work with the fact that there's an inherent nirvanic perfection that's here. And also this inseparability from harm. Right, the non-duality. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the ideas of this teaching is to practice holding those both. To be able to practice holding them both. Because we usually want to be like, oh, it's perfect, so it's separate from the suffering. Right. Or it's really bad, so it certainly can't be Buddha. And so being able, you know, a lot of uh, Mahayana teachings in general are trying to get fluid with holding really polar views. So that's on the one hand. So those can become very flowing within us. Uh, but the other thing um, is uh, that you can use them more sort of like practically speaking. So for example, are there any moments in anyone's life where you're like, it would really help me to just take a moment and be like, I am whole. I am well. There's nothing wrong with me. We need this. Human beings need this to just take in an embodiment of our goodness. So it's like, then it's like we're applying the teaching as a medicine. And then on the other hand, you might be like, you get very complacent and you're like, oh, I'm pretty good, everything's fine. And it's like, well, we got to open up our eyes and be like, oh, here I am, Mara across from Fort Snelling. Let's wake up. Waking up means, you know, getting close to suffering and also being free of suffering. Somehow, mysteriously, simultaneously. Other, uh, you know, people on the Zoom, I, I'm hoping that if you just unmute yourself, we'll hear you. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Robin. This is a question about Vasubandhu. Mm. Um, 
and the Abhidhamma, mm. which, yeah, I'm just, I don't know much about Vasudhandu. So I know in the Abhidhamma, there's this, uh, yeah, this practice leading to Kalapa, to like, ultimate reality, sense of ultimate reality, mm. which we don't practice here, but it's in the Abhidhamma. Um, and so I'm curious, was Vasubandhu criticizing that with his commentary in the Vishnaya? <clears throat> uh i i cannot that's a little too detailed for my knowledge i don't actually know the abhidharma that well so but what i can say is just hearing it in general the idea that you can see ultimate reality is fundamental to yogachara and in fact the claim is you're seeing it already everything's already of complete realized nature but you might not be aware of it so i'm not sure how that the the pali abhidharma is different than the slightly later in like in the Abhidharma Kosha, they're similar but not identical. Which I mean, Kalapa is that's different than the ultimate reality being, you know, the unfabricated or the deathless expressing itself. You know, it's samsara and Nibbana being, you know, one of the same. Mm -hmm. And in the Abhidharma, there's you know, seeing, yeah, this thing called Kalapa. So I was wondering, curious if you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've, I've read some of this stuff. The Abhidharma is just, it's, it's crazy. Has anyone ever read any Abhidharma? It is so bonkers. So it's like really uh, dense. And so the truth is, like, I've read enough Abhidharma to be able to talk generally about it, and then really look at how later in life, um, Vasubandhu, he's got this unbelievably complex, detailed understanding, but then he starts to just be like, well, listen, really, let's break it down to some much more simple elements, which is not to say that, you know, doing that really detailed, fine-grained work you're looking at is great. I can't really speak to it because I don't know it well enough. Um, but I would say coming out of the Abhidharma, since we're talking about it, for me, the main thing Vasubandhu says is notice your body and notice how you feel. Like when I, I'm just like, you can get way more complex. But a huge amount of it boils down to that. Is if you look at the way consciousness is structured and how it creates suffering, one of the most effective things you can do at any moment is notice your body and notice how you feel. Uh, but then, I don't know, Palapas, we can talk about that later. Maybe I'll learn something. Uh, other uh, queries. I like to just point out that your query might just be like, you know, my son is driving me crazy. What should I do? You know what I mean? It's like someone's going to ask a question about, you know, something very uh, erudite and any kind of question is welcome. Let me just see if uh, I will come back, but let's just see. Is there anyone on the online who wants to say anything? Making that extra space. Okay, maybe not. Uh, I, okay. I would like to say something. Can you hear me? Go ahead. No, so okay. I want to talk about well, the imagination for a second because you used it in a way in this book that what I imagine to be true about the world is absolutely downright false. And I'm stuck in a bunch of conditions and a vision that isn't active. But the imagination is also, as I see it, a muscle. And there's nothing that you could call empathy or uh, compassion in a way without me imagining your experience. So my, uh, or the founding fathers who are being on the account right now, but they couldn't, they imagined the country way before there was a country. So the imagination is also used as a liberation tool, as I see it. Yeah. Um, is that seen in keeping with Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the idea is to realize because we're imagining, we should imagine in a way that's liberative. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's like, wow, what could we, I mean, right now I'm planting seeds that are going to make the world. And, you know, you might notice that when you're like, oh, I'm like at an important meeting. Do you notice that when you're brushing your teeth? Because it matters. At our Zen center on the wall, we have the standard tooth washing got to actually we just took it down but it's like brushing my teeth i vow to cut through delusion and find the eye teeth of wisdom washing my hands i vow to wipe away all defilements 
using the toilet. I vow to flush away all the defilements. Well, Zen people are weird, I know, but it's a reminder that your life is not trivial. And so, but uh, so there's that kind of conventional imagination, which is supported by this vision as like a way of doing imagination, but also imagination just means exper to experience something. But yeah, yeah, it's like uh, in the book, an example I use is like, uh, like, is it Copernicus, Galileo? You know, someone, you, he didn't just observe, he had to imagine that everything was like not revolving around the earth. And in fact, the earth revolved around the sun. It was an observation, but he also had to imagine it. And now we all imagine that together too. And it seems a little better. And then it was like, they had gravity. Everyone was like, well, you know what gravity is? Well, now someone imagined a whole new way of looking at gravity. That was Einstein. And it's like, yeah, so we can keep imagining afresh, afresh. <clears throat> yeah. In the use of entheogens to have an experience or a taste of sort of a reality outside of the dualistic, what do they do with the entheogen ceremony? Entheogen, what is that? A, a psychedelic ceremony. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, what what would, what, I don't know what, uh, I can say, I don't know what Vasubandhu would think about a psychedelic ceremony because I just haven't seen any record of discussion <laughs> of it. Um, <laughs> You know, Vasubandhu is, you know, focused on helping us have a, he focuses on the worldview itself from which practice emerges. So that tends to be, so there's not a ton of practical instructions in Vasubandhu. It's like he's giving the worldview and you go, oh, given if I saw the world like that, how would I act? I'd probably meditate because that would help me to see through my patterned habits of consciousness and help me be more calm, you know, things like that. Uh, as far as psychedelics, um, I just really don't know. Uh, I'm a bad person to talk about psychedelics because I'm a recovering drug addict who's used mountains of psychedelics and it didn't work out well for me. So, um, so basically, I'm just a, a a bad a bad source on that. But clearly, there's you know there's a lot of new science that um, using psychedelics can have therapeutic benefits. And so anyway, I'm just a I'm just a bad source. Thank you, though. May your inquiry be for the benefit of all beings. <clears throat> Other queries. Hi. Thank you for um. Thank you for your teaching. I was um. Something just arose. It's been. Oh, is it's someone been, talking, but we can't hear them? Maybe. Uh, oh, this is Let's Jessica. See. Can you hear me? You're not muted, but we're not hearing you. Well, we may not be able to hear the Zoom folks. Sorry about that. You want to check it out? Or... Oh yeah, you want to send it in the chat? That'd be cool. Is it if it's short? Chat me. You want to just try talking one more time and we'll see if we hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, there's probably been all these people trying to talk this whole time. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we're hearing you. Well, at least I am. You're kind of quiet. So if you can make your question short, mm. I'll let people know. Yeah, I, I'm just um, noticing sort of like there seems to be this uh, um, sort of reminder uh, that I'm hearing often in teaching. Um, about the linguistic sort of like construction of reality and like and, and there's this, um, this sort of movement away from like the subject realizing object or the inside outside kind of thing and like I'm, I think of like French feminism or Lucer Garay or something who was always talking about sort of this always relational you know like reminding ourselves always that everything's relational and I think of like gravity as an equation is, is a relation between two things. It's not just, you know, the earth is pulling me. I'm, I'm in a relationship in a, as the equation. So it's just, um, this reminds me sort of, of of that. And I'm wondering if you have sort of like as an instruction, how to kind of like remind ourselves in a practice to like, as a daily life practice to, to sort of keep in mind that relational 
use of language. Okay, well, this is great. This is, we got my kind of people in this meeting. So anyone who's seeing the connection between this body of teaching and like feminist theory, I'm like, yeah, yeah it's in there. Anyway, so the question was, we're seeing, uh, there's talk in Yogacara about how our experience is linguistically constructed and how that has to do with the objectify, objectification of things. Um, and how rather than viewing ourselves as in a world of objects, we can constantly be coming back to recognizing we're in relationship and relationship is where liberation happens. And then how do we actively make a practice of reminding ourselves of that? And, you know, I think there are many, many things you can do and it's great coming back to how Vasubandhu focuses on the frame, reminding ourselves. What if you just remind yourself, this is about relationship just keep reminding yourself this isn't about relationship objectification so like in the most common understanding you know people will know some feminine the red feminist thing it's like objectifying females bodies is like harmful derp but you know in yoga chart it's like objectifying anything is harmful objectifying anything is harmful so uh so it's i'm not saying that Clearly, objectifying female bodies causes harm. Yes, and also. But anyway, how do we remember that? There are many things I will do. One thing to do is, if you think you're involved in a conflict, if you think you're involved in a conflict, can you think, this is a collaboration? The people you're collaborating with don't even need to know it's a collaboration. <laughs> they don't. But you can remember, I can be in collaboration because I want to be free. And I want us all to be free. It doesn't feel good to be in a conflict. I'd rather be like, given that you did that, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So like when you're trying to get something done with a group of people, it's like, keep trying to come back. How can we make this a collaboration where I can remember it is? Um, when you're setting boundaries in a relationship, you ever have to be like, you know what? I'm just not talking to you anymore. Realize you haven't left that relationship because it's not possible. You can't leave any relationships. Everything is dependent nature. You are engaging in that relationship by choosing to be separate. That's a good way to engage in it, perhaps, at that moment. But you haven't ended it because you can't end anything. So finding ways to just, you know, these are some nice, simple ones. The other one is to practice meditation in a simple way. The style of meditation I'm trained in, Zazen, is fundamentally about relationship. What we do is we just try and recognize this is the relationship we're in. It's like this. You know, we're just like, I hear sensations, thoughts, visual images. No, I'm in relationship with all this. How can I offer myself to this? Just with care, the simple care of attention. Attention is compassion. A lot of times people say, you keep talking about compassion. How do I do that? How can I feel compassion? You don't have to feel compassion. To be with suffering is compassion. When, when a feeling comes up in you that's sad or angry or anxious, to just see it, it's already compassion. And when you hear someone suffering, to just hear them, it's already compassion. You don't have to have some special feeling that you don't have. The nature of awareness is compassion. And that's already all that's here. Because everything is already complete realized nature. That's how Buddhists see. And that's what you're seeing. Okay, I was going to stop, but I did see a, a question in here. This is really great. Uh, all right, well, I can't quite speak to that too well. I'm not too familiar with the material in the, in the chat, but I'm glad to hear you're making connections with the material. I do think it might be opportune to wrap up here. I mean... Good Lord, I was driving over here, as I told Robin when I got here, and I was like, uh, it's too late for me to be out at 6.30. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Can we 
winter time. It's winter time. It's a good time to come inside. Be quiet. The darkness. Embrace the darkness. To let the darkness in. I know sometimes it's a little painful, but this it's our world. It's our world. Why not love it? So thank you all for uh, for your attention. It's been really sweet to be here with you. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll see you all around soon. And you all be well. Thanks a lot. Um, oh. I'll just say a few words about uh, Donna. And as many of you know, um, Common Ground uh, is functions, runs on Donna and generosity. Donna's the poly word for generosity. And our teachers, um, guest teachers like Ben and I'm the office manager here, Oliver. Um, yeah, it's all, all from from Donna and the many volunteers who give their time, like the building committee and the garden committee to keep this place going. So if you would like to give, you can give online um, on our website. We also have an iPad in the lobby and we have um, some bowls out, out in the lobby if you'd like to give with cash or check. And you can ask me any questions if you have so much. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.